Okay, welcome everybody. We're here for another episode of Objectivist Living on the Iran Brooks Show, and we got a real treat today. We've got Professor Tara Smith uh, joining us to talk about happiness, a great topic for the new year. Uh, just to give you a quick introduction, uh, uh, Tara is a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas. She's actually the BB&T Chair for the Study of Objectivism the only chair in objectivism anywhere in the world. So uh, that, that is uh, really terrific and exciting. Uh, she's got a very distinguished academic career. I'm not going to go over the whole list, but I will mention uh, her four books, um, which I highly recommend. Her first book was on uh, moral philosophy, uh, sorry, political philosophy, uh, moral rights and political freedom, and then uh, on metaethics, viable values, uh, then a study of Ayn Rand's ethics, uh, Ayn Rand's normative ethics, uh, which was published by Cambridge University Press, and then the latest, Judicial Review in an Objective Legal System, also by Cambridge University Press. So congratulations, Tara, on all those books. Thank you. And uh, we're going to roll right into um, into discussion of happiness. So what is happiness? <laughs> It's a little bit complicated, but in some ways it's not too complicated at all. Um, it is a two-part phenomenon, I think, and we often lose sight of that. That is, people tend to think of happiness as a feeling or a way you feel. Uh, maybe it's a longer-term feeling than, oh, I feel good because my team won last night or the sun is out or that particular pleasure that I'm having now, oh, the ice cream is, is pleasing. It's not a feeling like that. It's a more all-encompassing, long-range kind of state of awareness. But I think Ayn Rand put it very well when she said, basically, happiness is the way you feel, the state of awareness that comes from your achieving values. And this is why I say it's two-part. It's not just awareness or a state of consciousness, though that's part of it, and that's the natural part that most people most readily speak of. You know, is he happy? That's a, a, you know, how is he feeling? But underneath that, how is he living? How is his life going? In particular, is he achieving? Is he making progress on the things that are most important to him? So the achievement of values really brings in the fact that being happy is doing something. It's an activity. It's a course of action. And this is why even philosophers today who speak of happiness, who really examine it, but also going back to the ancient Greeks, Aristotle and Plato, they didn't use the word happiness so much as flourishing, yeah. which is something that you do or think about thriving. Now, you have to interrupt me. Probably not too many people probably say this to your own. Feel free to interrupt me because I can get excited about Go happiness and on and on. No, this is this is great. Go okay. for it. Yeah, no. So it's you know it's this sort of two, I won't say two track, but happiness is feeling good about your life for good reason because your life is basically going well. But again, in particular, you are achieving your values. You are challenging yourself, pushing yourself, growing in a constructive direction such that, oh yeah, yeah, this feels good. I'm generally, you know, in a, in a good mode in terms of my attitude. So my it's both a, a, an emotional state or a state of awareness and an activity, something you, you, you actively engaged in. Yeah, it's not just a static or yeah. kind of passive condition. Yeah. Definitely, and and so you could be, you could be momentarily sad, but be happy. Definitely, and I think we all are. I think yeah. even the happiest people in the world, it is absolutely natural that a, a couple of things, both that sometimes some bad things will happen, that will you know some seriously bad things will happen, that will naturally affect your emotions, right and. The more significant the negative that occurs, the more natural and the more acutely you will feel badly, right? So happiness isn't a report on the ups and downs. You know, it's not your emotional temperature Monday over Tuesday because they won last night. Oh, but now it's really cold, so now I'm miserable again. It's not that kind of up and down thing, but it's perfectly compatible with being happy, with even knowing my life is in good shape. 
that, you know, the last couple of weeks, things have been a little, I've gotten a couple of rejection letters from journals or something, or you had that setback on my taxes, or, right? I mean, yeah. ups and downs are certainly compatible with the basic trajectory. The basic direction and course is one of positive progress. Yeah. And is it, do you think it's uh it's easy to tell when somebody's happy, or is it something you can only do about yourself? That's a really interesting question, I think. Um, it's So, I don't know, a few thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's hard to really know another person and what's going on for that person. In many of our lives, there are, though, one or two or three people that you get really close to, such that you come to know her really well, yep. right? And, you know, so maybe it's your your husband or wife or spouse or um, a really friend. close friend. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, a really close friend, yep. A really close yep. friend. But sometimes it's a family member who you've been, you know, close with for better or worse for, you know, decades. There are a few people you can get to know really well, such that I think, you can pretty much know or have a good indication. Uh, you know, you know this person in enough depth, through enough variety of experience. You get to see really how they're leading their life such that you can make some pretty educated conjectures about whether or not they're happy. But at the same time, you know, it's hard to know ultimately how they feel. You can certainly make judgments about what you think they're doing with their lives and how they're spending it and you could you know how they're spending their lives and sometimes i think it's quite natural and rational and appropriate to think but some of what my friend jack is doing is getting in his way and setting himself up for the kinds of frustrations that he's experiencing and his feeling but all of that said i also want to say you know what's most important in thinking about happiness is thinking about one's own, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And that's, that's what this is for, because you've got to do it for yourself, ultimately. Nobody else can make you happy. That's something I can say a lot on. Yeah. But what's most important isn't, oh, let me assess the others out there, and are they, you know, are they doing well enough? Where would I score them in, this, in the scorekeeping ledger? It's, what can I be doing differently? To the extent I feel some satisfaction, uh, some dissatisfaction, let's say, that doesn't seem just sporadic or, or only a reaction to things out of my control. If I look back on 2017, for instance, as I hope we're all doing this week, uh, and, you know, as I think about, as I try to think honestly about the good, the bad, the what can I control, or if not ultimate, you know, wholly control, what can I affect more, you know, affect, ha have more influence over, I'm looking for those things where I can, you know, make some difference to how things really go for me, as well as how I feel. So good. So before we get to how to how the how to, um, mm. to what extent is this view of happiness uniquely objectivist? Um, and and you know maybe we can contrast it a little bit with Aristotle or with or with mm. some modern philosophers or. or yeah. Or even psychology, to what extent the psychologist recognize this as being what we mean by happiness? I haven't done enough systematic study of the subject um, to say definitively. I will say this. I've read a number of books on happiness. Some written basically by philosophers, some by psychologists. A little bit of history, too, of the concept. And there are some really good ideas in a lot of those books. I mean, many of them have oh, two or three really good ideas or really good spins on or ways of putting important truths. I haven't seen anything remotely close to putting the whole package together or in a sense getting that it's not just a package. Yep. You know, it's not better time management and <laughs> you know, have a better sex life and be bolder with your boss to ask for a raise. It's not so much that kind of self-help piecemeal approach, which I think is a lot of what, what we get in the happiness studies these days, as having, you know, and this is where objectivism is, is I think, unique. It takes the right philosophy to be happy. You've got to be living on premises, on fundamental beliefs 
that are in tune, attuned to the way things are, to the realities that you face about yourself, your own abilities and weaknesses and strengths and limitations and intelligence and what have you, as well as uh, premises that are realistic to the demands of human nature in general and the world around us. So, and I'll come back to Aristotle in a second, but I think objectivism, to my knowledge, uniquely says you have to have a reality-respecting philosophy. In particular, you have to have an ethic, a moral code, a set of virtues or principles or basic guidelines for how to lead your life that is geared toward your fulfillment, your feeling rewarded, your being productive and achieving and proud. So the whole approach to happiness is just hand in glove with the whole approach to the purpose of living. So let me say a little bit about Aristotle. Um, and here again, I'm not an Aristotle expert. There are others you could get on who know their Aristotle more fully than I. Basically a very right-minded approach, I think, to happiness. Ultimately, he says something like, and again, he uses eudaimonia is the Greek, usually translated flourishing these days. It's activity in accordance with virtue. So he very much agreed with objectivism, obviously, before before our time. Um, uh, he agreed with this idea that it's a manner of living, at least at its heart, at its center. He made some other important points. He was realistic about the fact that you can't control everything. You can live as virtuously as is desirable, but some things out of your control can seriously mar mm -hmm. your experience and the way you will feel. He was, he was realistic about that. But I mean, also, I think he wasn't a full-throated individualist. He saw the role of the community as somewhat larger and different, I think, than objectivism sees it, which is not to knock community or social friendships and relationships. Okay. Um, but he, so he was, I think, very much on the right track, but I don't know any philosophy other than objectivism that, that puts it all together in the right way. And again, I do want to say there's, there is some really interesting material out there these days on happiness. It's a good thing that it's been getting more attention, you know, even called happiness, and psychologists in particular now have a lot of skepticism about a lot of their ways of having people self-report happiness and what they count as happiness. But in some of the works and some of the philosophy works that I've read, and some of them will talk about well-being, again, they're not always using that same vocabulary, yeah. But you'll see some really important aspects of living a good life and a life that will be fulfilling. You'll see a lot of them talked about there. Good. So let's talk about the fact that objectivism is unique. Well, I mean, with the exception maybe of Aristotle. In saying that the individual deserves to be happy. That it's, you know, because there's so much original sin in one variety of the other out there in the world. And one of the things of the f refreshing things about there being so many books about happiness and self-help yeah. is it seems like people are maybe overcoming that and maybe seeking. Yeah. No, that is good. I think it's also to some extent a sign of how miserable people have gotten. I, I think to some extent really it's, God damn it. This is lousy, this, you know, not feeling fulfilled or feeling lost or distressed and so on. So, okay, if that guy, if that self-help guy, or that, not just self-help, but if that deeper area of real systematic research in psychology is going to give me permission to be happy, at least in some corners of my life, yeah, I want to read that, I want to get that. That's a good thing. But again, I, I do think it comes from this general denial that, you should be happy. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I, d I don't want to make it sound like Aristotle is the only person in the history of philosophy to have ever said some positive things about happiness. I mean, there were, even John Locke does say things like, sure. it is your duty to be happy. Now, again, that's got some problems. But well, at any rate... Made, it made the Declaration of Independence. So, uh, well, so yes. it was no, prevalent a... during the Enlightenment, that idea of happiness was definitely... Yes, and the idea that your individual thriving is a worthwhile goal. And, you know, we get such, mi at best, mixed signals on this. Just think quickly for a sec. You go to somebody's college commencement, and what is everybody, all the graduates are told, now you can turn and, and give back. Now you can serve something larger than yourself. 
I mean, they're just, you know, it's all about others, basically. Service. That's the price. That's the rent we pay for living, right? As a few people have said, right? But you go to somebody's wedding and you wish them all the happiness in the world. Well, now, wait a second. Am I supposed to be happy? I thought I wasn't supposed to be happy. I've been trained my whole life, right? I've been educated into it's all about serving others. It's all about me, right? It's not about me. So no wonder people emerge when they're 18 or 22 or 35 and they don't know what they want. So, you, I mean, you know, happiness, I, I said at the beginning, it has to do with achieving values. People don't know what they value. They know what they've been told to value. Yep. They know what the good people, in quotes, you know, what the supposedly good people value. And they go along, all right? But they haven't really paid serious attention or devoted serious thought to what's going to make me happy? What are the kind of values I enjoy achieving? What's the kind of work I enjoy doing? So I feel like I've drifted a little bit from the heart of your question here. But I do think that because we live in a basically collectivist, altruist culture, those are the dominant philosophies, we're steered away from thinking about happiness. And we kind of, you know, we cheat and we, we steal it here and there. Yep. You know, so self-help books are self-help books. That's a good thing. And they've been around for a long time. That's not just a new phenomenon. But we cheat on the self-sacrifice because we have to. You know, what I hope happiness studies can lead to, but what, you know, apart from what else is going on, what objectivism says is you have no reason to apologize. Yep. For pursuing your rational happiness, your rational interest. Um, anyway. Yeah, and 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 so many people. They, I, I think you. I think the way you phrase it, they they steal these moments of happiness. But those moments of happiness, exactly what doesn't add up to real happiness, which is this. Yeah. Because that requires a whole different approach to life. No, I think that's true. A certain yeah. consistency about life. So even that makes them frustrated because they start feeling guilty. or they, And you see this in so many people oh, because definitely. the altruism is so deeply entrenched. Deep in set, them. right. No, it, it is. I mean, we've just, it's as if we have a tin ear. When people like objectivists talk in a positive way about egoism or, uh, you know, self, like, we can't be understand, you know, we, what now I'm speaking, let's say I'm a non-objectivist, right? What is she talking about, Tara? Wait, like, she seems a nice person and a normal person, but what could he possibly mean, your own, when he says things that are good about selfishness? We're so just enmeshed in this mindset that can't conceive, but again, we conceive it when we wish a, per a couple all the happiness in the world, when a baby is born and you want that kid to flourish. But, oh, no, but I can't flourish. Yeah. Yeah. Or, not really. Or, I've got to feel guilty about that. So, yeah, then these moments or just these little pockets where, well, you're allowed to ask for a raise, but not too much, otherwise you're a greedy SOB or something, right? Of course that's going to chip away at your own sense of how you're leading your life. Really hard to be happy if you don't have self-esteem. Yes. Really hard to be happy if you don't believe in what you're doing and believe in the rightness, the, you know, yeah, this is good what I'm doing. But if you think, oh, no, selfishness is ultimately rotten, well, it's going to be really hard to be happy, and that's why I think we have so many people today who are at least recognizing this isn't working. But, of course, they do tend to then, you know, look for solutions. If it isn't medication, it's meditation, is it, right? You know, just reshuffle what you care about. Or, or <laughs> it's focus on others, or it's, or, it's, or it's try to be more consistently altruistic somehow, and that'll, you know, they can't, it seems like, well, they, they, they want to have their altruism, and, and they'll try to massage everything in order to somehow yeah. keep it. And that's yeah. the one thing that I find most, most difficult to challenge people on, uh -huh. is to get, yeah, it's give not, up their altruism. Yeah. No, a good life is not a kind of a checkerboard of moments spent at odds. Uh, that kind of conflict is just a recipe for frustration for, for self-doubt, and for good reason. I mean, when you try to live on antithetical premises of egoism and of altruism, it can't be done, and you're undermining your own sense of your own judgment, the part of you that thinks, not just feels, but thinks, yeah, I, I'm going to die someday, right? The years are going, 17, 18. I ought to try to have a good time here. 
And again, what people have to understand is, when I say have a good time, this is not about the expense of other people. This is not about expo uh, exploitation or anything like that. Right? It's about people being happy by spending enough time really thinking about the kind of work and activity and values that they want to embrace, such that pursuing those values in a deeply thoughtful and sustained and sustainable way will achieve values and give them that, that sense of reward. Yeah. And that's what differentiates us from the, not just from the, um, you know, not just from the exploiters, but also from the hedonists. Right, so, so you're emphasizing oh. the deep thought that goes into a long-term oh, pursuit of def values. Definitely, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, one that you know, one clear example that I think about a lot, just because I, as a university professor, you know, you, you think about college-age students um, thinking about their careers and what they want to do with their lives. That is such an important question. And while on the one hand you see people really struggle with this, in some ways I don't see them struggle all that deeply at all you know they you know they feel a little uncertainty about what major majors they all declare two or three these days to declare and that sort of thing but ultimately it's you know well the pressures from the parents the pressures from society to do good um, I'll make one comment too this is a little bit tangential but I read some poll recently of I think it was entering college students and I, I was taken aback, I don't remember the figure, but by how many said what they really wanted was to make a lot of money. And part of the way I was surprised was yeah. because, man, even if you think that, you're not supposed to say that these days, and God knows they all know that, right? But I thought this is in a way a sign of how people don't think about the substance of what's going to be fulfilling for me. What do I enjoy? Do I enjoy so you know, programming software? Do I enjoy solving this kind of engineering problem? Do I enjoy working with other people or these medical things, right? What's the actual substance of values? I think we often just say, oh, yeah, well, money, because it's this kind of stand-in for real values, or at least that's the way it's often treated in our society. And, oh, yeah, other people will know what you mean if you say you want to make a lot of money. So it, this way I can avoid really thinking about, what the hell am I going to do with all that money? Like, what do I want to do? If somebody said I want more time, it would be natural to ask, oh, what do you want to do with this more time you're going to have in yeah. your retirement or whatever it might, right? You want a lot of money. Oh, we just take that as, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. Yeah, people want money. What do you, you know, what do you want to do with your life? Ooh, that's a hard, self-interested question to grapple with. But it's, it's, it's got to be grappled with for people to be happy. And again, they've got to accept that it's okay, again, to put it mildly. It's okay. It's good to pursue your happiness. So let's let's shift over to talk about how one achieves happiness. So what you you, you know you, you've already said quite a bit, but but what yeah. advice does objectivism give in to an individual who, who wants and believes he deserves to be happy? Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say I was going to start by saying you know you do have to have this conviction that you deserve it, right? That I don't have to apologize for this. This doesn't have to be half-hearted or, well, you know, but I'm giving half my week to the, the soup kitchen or anything like that. I mean, A, you have to believe. You have to think and you have to believe. It's got to be sort of in your, in your soul, yeah, this is right for me to be happy, right? And if you want it, then you've got to think, as we were saying, you've got to think really hard about the most enjoyable activities for you. And, you know, one of, well, one of the really central things that Ayn Rand sees as at the heart of a happy life is productive work, productive achievement. Now, I mean, the reasons for this, I, I won't get into here, they have to do with the nature of men. We have to produce just to, to uh, sustain ourselves in very bare physical terms, but also psychologically. It's in our nature that we have to be creating and growing in order to sustain ourselves physically and psychologically and emotionally. So this is why, you know, repeatedly I think of come back to this notion of work, production, achievement. But again, it's achievement of values. You're creating values, right? They could be material values. They could be spiritual values. You could be creating art. 
Yep. You could be yep. writing music, right? You could be making mousetraps, you know, it could be the most physical and mundane, or, you know, whatever, whatever combination. But you're making things that are good for human life. But you've got to figure out what do I enjoy doing that's, you know, that's going to pay the bills as well. Um, and I think a lot of the happiest people in the world are the people who are the most productive. I mean, you read sometimes, just, just earlier I was reading... Um, from an essay by your co-author of your new book on finance, your own, on, on wealth. A very good book, I might say. Um, now, I was reminded of Steve Jobs, things I've read before about him, but he so loved the doing. Yep. It was great that he was acquiring all these this money along the way, but he didn't retire the first time he had a few million dollars. It's like, great, that can fuel me being even more exploratory, more adventurous, more ambitious. I get to do more of what I want to do. This is why I love Mondays. Yeah. I'm a little resentful that Monday's a holiday, and I'm actually going to make myself take this. It's like, <laughs> damn it, it's so much fun. But you got to find what is the fun thing that's a worthwhile thing, that's objectively valuable, right? You've, so, but you've got to give serious thought. You've got to pay honest attention to what you really enjoy. You've got to be open, for instance, to finding, hey, I went down a wrong path there. Yep. I thought majoring in this, or I thought a career in that, and I've spent two or three years, but you've got to be honest with yourself. You know, one thing I think the pursuit of happiness takes is a lot of ongoing introspection, honest reflection about what's working and what's not, both in terms of your core commitments as well as, you know, some of the more peripheral things in your life. But I would say, so one of the, again, I've stressed production, I hope, but purpose. You've got to have a main thing that your life is about, that it's for, that's going to structure um, what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even if that does not provide as much money, I mean, that is the scary thing about people pursuing money for money's sake, is that they're, they're foregoing, well, what really, what do you enjoy doing? What do you love yeah. doing? Yeah, and sometimes yeah. those things are not going to make as much money. Right. But, I mean, we all know, I mean, it, it's cliche to say a lot of people will, and I mean, but it's true. Many people will turn down a career or a job, a specific job, that might give them a good amount more money because they find it more rewarding to be the elementary school teacher or the, the thing in a not, well, not so well-paying job. Now, obviously, there are people, there, there are pursuits that aren't even that well structured as an elementary school teacher, you know, try to make it as a playwright or what have you. Um, so there are obviously periods in a life where it, it'll make sense to do some things primarily just for the money, but, you know, and other things more for the, the love. But you've got to keep that alive, which is really difficult. You've got to keep time for doing it, and you can't eternally postpone. I mean, there is that danger of constantly okay but i'm just going to make the money this year oh well just this year just it's, the clock is ticking your experience is going by you want to try to and obviously people are in different circumstances financially and health wise and so on i don't want to minimize any of that but you've got to be looking and heaven knows we have so much more control over this than anybody else at any time in history right so we've got to take responsibility, I think, for our lives. Realize that happiness isn't a matter of chance. You know, chance things out of your control can impact it, but the core of it, it's what you do. It's how you lead your life. And being honest about that, not so much to berate yourself if you think you've taken some missteps or fallen into some bad habits, but to get, again, I have this you know, New Year's outlook in mind, to get on the best track, the most fruitful track you can. And these questions, because they're deep about what's really going to be satisfying work to you, they're not the kinds of questions you can answer in a weekend. Okay, everybody have your answers by the first. Monday's come. You know, it's like, be thinking about this. Um, and that's, I get that question a lot. I mean, I get the, I get the question of, how do I discover what I'm passionate about? How do, mm -hmm. how do I do it? And it's, it's interesting that so many people are struggling with that and and they're looking for some external answer to yeah. to, to come yeah. through. so any any practical advice on how somebody could go about oh wow that's a, interesting. I mean, it obviously involves a lot of introspection and maybe even a little bit of trial and error and, and I, I was gonna and, say and living because i think some people there really are two or three or four 
really viable contenders. So you may need to try them out a little bit, but you've got to try them in a thoughtful way. And what I mean there is be paying attention to the specifics of, here's what I like about this, here's what I don't like about this, right? I mean, I know these days, for instance, a lot of young people, internships are more are, are just more in than ever. Well, okay, take advantage of some of those so that you can shadow the doctor or shadow the engineer or shadow the principal of the school. You know, so you're actually walking through a little of what this other person does, but you've got to be thoughtfully paying attention to what you like and what you think about it and not uh, and try to avoid that trap of, well, this is so respectable, you know, the parents are so impressed. I mean, it's not that you'll consciously think that, but you've got to screen out the unconscious there. Um, yeah, I don't know in terms of practical advice. But again, I do want to bring it back at some level to the more abstract. You've got to think about the basic principles you're trying to uphold in your life. So this is where I think Ayn Rand's virtues, the virtues I talk about in one of the books that you mentioned uh, Ayn Rand's normative ethics, right? She talks about rationality. She talks about pride. She talks about independence, right? And, and a handful of integrity. Um, did I say justice? I mean, there are real keys that help you even assess not just job prospects, but career prospects. Would it really be worthwhile to be successful in this field, in this kind of work? Or is this actually something that's that's not terribly objectively valuable for human beings? So it does take a fair amount of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked about money and uh, I know you, you wrote an essay on uh, can money buy happiness. Yeah. Um, so link those two because on the one hand you're saying, well, you can't just focus on money. On the other hand, well, money is kind of important. Uh, no, no, good, good question. And uh, yes, I did write an essay called Money Can Buy Happiness, which I meant a little tongue-in-cheek, but only a little. Yep. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I welcome the chance to, to clarify a little bit on, on this, because again, a few minutes ago I was saying, oh, these students who report they just want money. Money as an end in itself is stupid, is useless. It's like, what's that? For? Money as an end in itself? Ah, if you want to talk about making money, the process of making money, earning money, the only way to do that in an honest economy, in an honest society, is by producing things that are valuable to people. Producing things that are valuable, right? That's how you make money. And what we've been talking about, having a productive career, productive work, creative work, that kind of purpose and commitment and drive and loving that, that's going to make you money, right, if you're any good at it. Which is another question, right? Yeah, Some are more yeah, skilled yeah. than others. They're better. Hard. Yeah. They might be equally hardworking and purposeful and virtuous, right? But if you're any good at it, that's how you make money. And the making is fun. And this even goes back to what we were saying about the very nature of happiness at the beginning of the conversation, right? It's doing things. It's doing things in a certain way and feeling good about it. You feel good when you've made something valuable. When I've given a good lecture just, just a, or taught a good class, oh, good. Oh, I handled that question well. Good. And believe me, many of the time, ah, damn, I didn't give a good answer to that question. I wasn't clear enough today. No, but you're going to feel the reaction, right? But my, again, the larger thought here is the way you do your work, if you do your work well in an objectively valuable way, that will be rewarded. You will get money, and that's a wonderful thing. Money for its own sake, and I think, again, using money just as a tag, because other people will understand the language of money, it can often be an evasion for thinking about what do you really value, what do you want to be doing. Um, but what, let me though say something else wonderful on money's behalf. Money, the more money you have, the more options you have, the more freedom you have to choose how you want to spend the weekend or the week. Whether you want to make dinner tonight or just, you know, order in or whatever it might, or go out for a nice dinner, right? I mean, there's a range, I mean, from the most simple to the most glamorous and luxurious, the more money you have piled up, the more you are liberated from the need to, okay, put tonight's dinner on the table, right? Or pay the bills next week, or next, right? The more money you have gives you more options to tailor your experience all the more to your enjoyment, right? But again, it also will fuel your 
taking more chances perhaps in your work or doing more adventurous or ambitious things. So money is so maligned and so unfairly maligned and those attitudes that most people have toward money are antithetical to the idea you should pursue your happiness. Because we're material beings, among other things, right? Among other things, we're not only material beings, but we sure as hell are material beings, right? I see your face across the Skype, right? I mean, we're material beings with material needs, with material wants, fulfilling them. Material That's pleasures, I mean, absolutely. Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it reminds me, you know, people always say, you know, how much money is enough, these billionaires? And then you get somebody like uh, Jeff Bezos, who takes his billions of dollars and invests them in uh, spacecraft to go to Mars, right? I mean, wow. I mean, that's right. that, well, how much like fun is that? Right? Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, and no, if he had like dream big, yeah. that's what. Oh, yeah. And if he yeah. had more tens of billions, he could do more big dreaming. I mean, there's no limit to how much we potentially want and can do and 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 and, yeah. uh, and can value. And part of what's interesting, even in a case like that, is. There are limits to how much wine he can drink yeah. in a day, right? Or how luxurious he can make his own life. And I wish him a very comfortable, and I mean, you know, I wish him all the comfort in the world, right? But what's going to drive that ambition to make more isn't, I've got more money in the bank. It's, I can fuel these ambitious dreams. Yep. God bless these people because we all benefit from these Absolutely. people. I mean, I, I love the thought that somebody I know, you know, it's like making more money. That's great. That, you know, it's, if I know that's an honest person, that's a hardworking person, a deserving person and all, I bless people's riches in the same way that you, that you want their happiness, you want their flourishing. And that's part of it. Right? It gives them more, more freedom in so many ways. So one, one question that often comes up is, is kind of the relative importance uh, for happiness of a career uh, uh, I won't say vo or a uh, romantic relationship or, or, you know, kind of the social contacts we have with other people. Mm -hmm. Well, I think your own work has to be central. That has to be the primary. Who you are, what you are. That's what you bring to any relationship, right? Friendships of different levels and depths, a romantic relationship, these are tremendously valuable, and I think they're also really important to the best kind of life that you can have, the ideally happy life you will have, you know, a person who gets you, who understands you, who shares your values about, at the most important levels and most fundamental levels, but that means you've got to have those values to share, yep. right? You, there's got to be somebody home, so to speak. There's got to be somebody there on the part of the two people, you know, the, the husband and wife, the, the two good friends, they've each got to have lives that are about something. They've got, they've got to have values that are not just in lip service, you know, they pay lip service to these values. No, in real commitment in the way they're leading their lives. And it's having those values and having a productive career that will lead them to be happy such that then they can, I mean, that's part of what they bring to a relationship. Ah, this person doesn't necessarily have the same career that I do. They might not enjoy the, you know, the software design that I do or whatever it might be. But this person cares about happiness. This person cares about rationality. This person cares about integrity. This person cares about limited government, right? I mean, there's yeah. some more fundamental values. They care about romantic art. Um, but again, the point is, there's got to be content or substance for a relationship to be a genuinely valuable, mutually beneficial relationships such that the two people can grow and the relationship can grow because they've got those core um, commitments. I should say, I think that's, that's an area within this whole subject of happiness and well-being that I haven't explored as much as I would like, you know, if one had all the time in the world. If I had millions, I guess, if I were Jeff Bezos, I'd have more time to devote to some of these questions. But that's one. I think, you know, there are the psychological rewards that we get from the, the people we can be closest to. And we get important rewards from other people. I don't, I don't want to diss everybody other than, you know, your best friend and your, and your husband or wife or something like that. I mean, we get all sorts of really positive positives from a lot of different friends that we have. Um, yeah, and there's not a yeah. lot of objectivism about that. There's not a lot of, 
No, it's true. There really isn't. And it would be it would be helpful, I think, if we developed more on that. And I also want to come back, I mean, again, something we, we talked about a little bit earlier, but self-esteem is so important yep. to being happy, yep. to having a good relationship with other people. Yep. I mean, you can, the more, I think, self-esteem you have, the more you can sniff the people who have serious deficiencies of self-esteem, and it it will set them up for failures of different sorts, including in relationships. You know, if you're not sort of comfortable in your own skin for good reason, because you're leading your life in a basically good way, and again, part of what that takes is I'm, I'm doing productive work, right? I'm committed to something, and I'm going after it full throttle. So the psychological aspects of the relationship are going to in part be a function of your psychological relationship with yourself, your self-esteem, and living productively but living rationally and virtuously in general. Again, as even Aristotle had, though he had it as said, but he had a slightly different set of virtues. Um, these all sort of, I think, mesh together. Yes, yeah, so I was actually going to ask you as, as uh, the relation between self-esteem and happiness. I mean, it strikes me you mm. cannot be happy unless you have self-esteem. Yeah, and yet so. to attain self-esteem in many respects, you have to do the same things that you're going to do to be happy. Yeah. No, I think it's a, I don't know, virtuous cycle maybe, yeah. or just reinforcing. Um, the more you do the kinds of things that will make you happy, the more you lead, a vir you lead, you lead your life virtuously, and at its center you have productive work, relationships with, if you can find them, some really good people who share the same values, right? Those are going to be part of its core, but you're also living virtuously, making your decisions, you know, in a rational, honest, just, etc. manner. That's going to build up your self-esteem, your, your, your sense that you're fit for this world. You know, Ayn Rand talks about that concept of sense of life. Your sense of life, your sense of yourself is an important part of that. Your sense of this world, yeah, that's a pretty good place to be. I'm, I'm looking forward to this 2018. I'm looking forward to tonight. You know, I mean, this, yeah. this is good. This is fun. That is all reinforced. That is all fed by making good choices, setting yourself up for success. Right? You can't, you can't control everything that, that happens by any means. And some, again, sometimes we suffer serious setbacks through no fault of our own. But you can set yourself up to be happy, to succeed, and to the extent that you know you're doing that, well, you know, I did what I could. I've been doing what I, I am doing what I can. Then even when you have the, the setbacks, your self-esteem is not injured, your basic sense of the world is not injured, and you can go on. And, and, and I think this is part of why so many people will recover from, you know, devastating losses in their lives, um, you know, of a, of a loved one, of a limb. I mean, it's a pretty you know, serious um, what do you think that the, and I don't know that there is a clear separating line of how much guidance we can get in terms of achieving happiness from philosophy versus psychology? Um, from the, you know, the self help books. Yeah, versus yeah that's interesting. That's interesting. I, I think we can get a lot from both. Yeah. I think the foundations have to be in the philosophy. And, and I do think, I think ultimately, why so many attempts at self-help fail or, you know, they seem to work for a while it, for a given person. They might try this new technique or this new therapy or this new meditation technique or these new drugs, right? Why a lot of them will work for a while but not ultimately is because they're trying to reconcile their pursuit of their own happiness with their being a good altruist girl. You know, they're being a good Christian soldier or whatever the guys, be it religious or secular or, you know, Peter Singer, give it all up to, you know, the needier kids in, in Africa or whatever. Um, so this is where I think philosophy is fundamental. Psychology is a tremendous help. And so anyway, I mean, your premises, you can't be happy on wrong premises. Again, happiness isn't your mood tonight or this week. It's how your life is going, your sense of how your life is going. You've got to be living on premises that are basically attuned to reality, rational, self-interested virtues. Okay. But in addition, we are complicated psychological beings. Again, I'm not a psychologist, right? And I do want to acknowledge that a person's just internal chemistry can make a difference to how they feel. 
So even while basically I think the way you're leading your life will give you good, you know, if you're leading your life well, you'll be inclined to have positive feelings about your life. We are, it seems, chemically complex, you know, neurochemically complex, and uh, and we do vary. And I do think there are people with just inherent uh, physical, uh, I don't know, if deficiencies or just abnormalities that can get in the way of their, fe- you know, their being they're having as positive an outlook as others. So I want to acknowledge that. What I, you know, I mentioned earlier that from some of my reading of both some philosophy and some psychology, you do find some, I think, very right-minded ideas. And I think it's great to try to borrow and take what you can, again, even if it's just a good way, a good new angle on something. But you've got to try to put the pieces from psychology together with philosophical, you know, fundamentals um shortcuts won't do it you know and, and again these days you know i've mentioned meditation a couple of times and i have nothing against meditation but so much of i think some so much of the instruction of meditation is don't care so much about this or just put things in perspective but if you're putting the wrong things in a different perspective if you're just shuffling a deck of false premises that's not the solution nor is stoicism which is very in you know so don't care so much detach or down or let go no happiness is the opposite it's about caring it's it's about caring it's about committing and acting like it and thinking like it such that yeah no i care and damn it this hurt this was a setback this was a failure this was a screw up on my part what am i going to do differently but it's it's going in full throttle, but thoughtfully full throttle, right? Don't care about, I mean, the things you can't control, yeah, you got to let them go, right? But there's so much that we can control. And this is, again, why I say taking responsibility for your happiness, for everything that you can do to try to construct it is really important. And I think a really positive message um, that, I, that I hope people will think about and take on. It take strikes on. me that... The part of the challenge with the, with the taking responsibility message these days is there seems to be this skepticism about free will, or attack on free will. We're all these, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it, evolutionary psychology. We're just, you know, you, and there's even, a, there's even these studies that say you either got the happiness gene or you don't have the happiness gene. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's just horrific. Yeah, no, I think that's ridiculous. And such again an evasion oh it's all in our genes you wish i want to say to some people or some miserable people it's like it's not all in our again we, you know we have different genes we have different internal dispositions we've got choices every waking hour of the day we've got choices and we know that and we see a thousand instances just in our own personal lives of the people who have the same upbringing the same parents in the same time of life with those parents and make radically different choices and set themselves up for very different outcomes in just uh, on a million different levels but no i think that's a really interesting observation that again so many people absorb this idea and we've been teaching it for a while in its different forms the denial of free will you know be it in the genes or in the advertising or it's something else that's responsible for what we think and what we want like hell, right? I mean, that's an evasion. That's a recipe for unhappiness, yeah. right? That's resignation. That's self-permission for not trying, right? I get too angry about that one to even... No, but that's a good one. I, I've got to think about that more because that really is a pernicious increasing part of this. Um, yeah, it's, it's, and it's, it's in the it's culture to, everywhere. Everywhere I go, I mean, I get... I get I get pushback on on free will. It's it's really from from Sam Harris on the one hand, yeah. right to uh, all the whole gamut yeah. of the whole the spectrum. assumptions, yeah. right? No, so many of the assumptions that are in even on campuses these days in some of the identity politics yes. Yes, going. Right. Oh well, no, no, you think that because you're an Israeli Jew, right? Ayn Rand, well, she was a you know she was a Russian Jew. Yeah, she didn't oh, have yeah. any option but to She and all the other Russian Jews who, yeah. who wrote about John Gall, right? Yeah. I mean, it's so absurd, and I think people 
with a little bit of honest thought, with just a little bit of honest thought, could see through it and see through, well, how am I making this argument if I want to try to convince somebody else of this argument, but if they don't have free will, what is it that I'm even hoping to accomplish by talking about this? Yeah. yeah. It's, so, um, to what extent do you think one has to hold explicitly the virtues or the, the ideas of objectivism or the, the, the ideas of the objectivist ethics in order to be able to be happy? In other words, can you be a non-objectivist and be happy? Yes, but, I would say. Uh, yeah, I don't think the only people who have ever been happy in the history of the world yeah. were objectivists. And, man, until Ayn Rand was born, nobody was happy. I don't, no, I, I just think that's, that's out to lunch, right? But, the reason I say there's a but, you have to be leading your life in a way that is basically in tune with the facts of reality, right? And not everybody is explicit, not everybody is consistent in the way they live. So, I mean, I even think there are people who have adhered to some extent to religious beliefs, mm -hmm. At, you know, but but who when they you know when push came to shove, really the most important things in life they were they were doing what they wanted to do, and I don't just mean in that hedonistic way of what they wanted to do, they were doing what was rationally good for them, because it was good for them. So it's not that I think one explicitly has to endorse uh, all of the principles of objectivism, but you've got to be living basically, and again, you know. Most people are inconsistent, will live on a certain premise much of the time, but not absolutely all of the time. But um, to the extent that you're living on fundamentally right-minded premises, you can lead a good life. However, I mean, what is so, more, so much more liberating and empowering is get the right philosophy, embrace the right philosophy, don't apologize in any way, consciously, subconsciously, for wanting your happiness, the best life you can have, wishing that for everybody else as well, I wish us all the best, right, but I wish us all doing the deeds that'll get us the best yeah. life that we can have, yeah. yeah, but no, I think it would be a, a mistake, a kind of rationalistic mistake, to assume only objectivists can be happy. Um, yeah, no, yeah. it strikes me as to the extent that you live a rational, reality-oriented life, to that extent, you can be happy. Yeah, and you can, and to the extent that the values that you're pursuing are genuine, objective yeah. value, you know, that they are worthwhile things, yeah. Um, and, of course, the, the flip side of that is that being an objectivist doesn't guarantee you happiness. Correct, right. Um it's really important. It's a tremendous aid, but you can't control everything that happens. Um, and again, even being a good objectivist, you know, a, a really virtuous person and all, there, th you know, there are important things that you can control. Not just about oh, you know, tragedy can strike, you know, you or your, you know, a loved one or something. I mean, your values will not. Your, your most deep set and core values will not always be going well and that's not going to feel good right when when i see what's going on politically in the country that's not exactly cheering yeah that's not exactly happiness conducive right now right but you can do what you can do right as as you have for many years at the helm of of the ayn rand institute for instance your own and as a lot of people you fight for what you care about and what you value there are going to be setbacks um and right but you think, again, in a big picture, long-term, conceptual, deep, systematic way about how to build the best kind of life, of the best values that you can have, and you go after that, and to the extent that you do, there is a, a sort of a brick of happiness, I think, that, that nothing can take away from you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, no, we can't completely control it. Bad things happen to good people. Um, for all sorts of reasons, our values do not always prosper, we're not always brilliant along with our virtue, but um, we have so much control. Taking responsibility for that can do us, yeah, so much good. Good. So one, uh, one final uh, question, you, you hinted at this uh, a number of times, it is, uh, it is New Year. Um, how, do you, how do you celebrate or what, what do you take as 
New Year. You, you mentioned you're, you're contemplating, you're thinking. I mean, what, what advice would you give people? This is a great opportunity to do what? Well, I'll sound like an academic, man. To think. No, I, I do take sort of a New Year's period every year. I also, conveniently, I have a January birthday, so it can sort of extend a little bit. But I always, you know, when Christmas is coming, I start thinking, well, you've got to be doing your serious thinking. So I really try, and, you know, it's off and on, but several days for a few weeks, I really try to think about how to make my life better. And that's coming from a position of thinking, I, have a, I think I have a great life. Yeah, I, and I basically my life is going well, and I think that's a function of, good fortune and good choices on my part, but it's not, com my point is, it's not coming from feeling dissatisfaction or deep dissatisfaction, all right, but it's, I want to constantly be tuning and be looking for where I might need more than fine tuning, you know, bigger tuning or, you know, really step back, take the big picture. Um, no, I think it's a great opportunity to do some really serious and deep probing, thinking about are things that you thought would make you happy, are they working in the way that, that you expected? Um, so that's the main thing I really, that I do to celebrate the new year. Um, yeah. Well, that's wonderful advice. Thank you. And uh, sure. so much for having me. Wish you a, a fantastic 2018. Likewise, a very happy, productive one, a very happy one. Good, good. good. Thank you, Tara. All right, thanks a lot, Your Own. Bye. Okay. Bye.